Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts and I'm glad you've taken the time to join us today as we look at our topic of how to calibrate a torque wrench and a torque screwdriver. Now, the, uh, the actual process of doing the actual calibration um, is not very difficult. Um, it's not really hard to understand, uh, but there are a lot of factors that go into um, why you would do something, how you do it, um, and those little things uh, can make a difference when you are doing the calibration um, or the testing of a particular tool. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in. If you do have any questions uh, along the way, feel free to type those into the chat and we will address those at the end of the presentation. So. Um, when we uh, talk about uh, torque calibration, um, basically what we um, are trying to achieve is to make sure that our tool, uh, in this case that we are testing, is reliable and it is accurate and it's producing the amount of torque that we would like to see from that particular tool. Now this is done through uh, the process of making sure that we're measuring um, and comparing the output of the tool to a, a device that can capture those readings that um, have a much higher standard of accuracy than the actual uh, tool that we're using. So this is the, the concept of the, uh, the calibration process. So um, within this uh, calibration uh, process, we do have uh, different standards that we can uh, test specific tools to. And these uh, standards come from different um, organizations uh, throughout the world. And so uh, ISO is a, uh, is a uh, body that uh, you probably uh, know, the International Organiza Organization for Standards uh, is one part of this. We also have uh, NIST or uh, NIST, the National Institute of standards and technology. We also have um, the ANSI or, or ANSI, American National Standard Institute. There is also the ASME or, or American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And so all of these different um, organizations um, have different uh, standards as it relates to how we should test a specific tool within a specific range. Um, so again, you may be familiar with the ISO 9001, which is a quality standard, uh, which deals with how you actually document um, certain things that happen within your facility or within your processes, and you are trying to continually um, improve that. The ISO 17025, uh, standard deals with the uh, actual calibration lab and also uh, certain certs uh, that are generated by that, uh, that lab. Then there's the ANSI uh, Z540 standard. Uh, and then we have a couple international uh, ones, um, the, the BS7882, which is a, a British standard. Uh, and then the German standard, which is DAKKS. Uh, so all of these different um, standards allow us to have some un uniformity when we are looking to um, do our calibration or uh, do our testing. So how does all of this uh, work? And the, the basic fundamentals are that we have traceability to the original or highest standard uh, that we have available. And so when we're talking about torque calibration, um, the uh, first item uh, that we uh, can look at was going to be the uh, dead weights, the hangers, and segment arms that are used uh, to calibrate uh, torque analyzers. And so the analyzer takes the analog signal from the tool output and generates a digital signal from that. And we can measure that, and that's going to give us our output for uh, or excuse me, it's going to give us our reading of the tool that we have uh, tested. And so this tool then is tested on different analyzers and sensors. And all of this 
is traceable back to the uh, original source. And so we have our tools, which are traceable to the analyzer. The analyzer is traceable to the dead weights. Uh, and then the dead weights are uh, traceable to the scale that's used uh, and so on. And so this traceability becomes the, uh, the actual uh, focal point of what we are trying to uh, achieve through the different uses of testing and standard procedures through the calibration process. So if we have uh, those things, we need to look at um, when we actually are doing the testing. Uh, and so the uh, calibration intervals can take place in a number of uh, different ways or different um, scenarios or different uh, philosophies around when we actually do the calibration process. So um, the ISO 6789, um, which deals with hand tools, this has a, a minimum of 5,000 cycles for a hand tool to be considered an ISO 6789 tool. So if that uh, 5,000 cycles happens within a, a certain amount of time, uh, you'd want to make sure that you are calibrating uh, that particular tool within that cycle period if you want to maintain the ISO 6789 specification. Now, uh, at Bounce, uh, we have a couple of hand tools that, uh, that we use that have a, a much greater cycle rate, uh, and we guarantee this as well. So our FG screwdriver series um, has a four times the standard uh, guarantee at 20,000 cycles for this particular tool. And on our uh, wrench line, um, our FG uh, C product, we have a cycle that we guarantee for 10,000 or a 2X of the ISO standard. So um, that is a, a little bit of information for you as well. Um, the other interval that we can look at is going to be a time-based type of scenario. So uh, every six months, uh, every 12 months, uh, that tool is sent out or is calibrated and the a sticker or a certificate is generated for that particular tool. Um, no matter uh, how much that tool has been used, uh, every uh, period that tool will become uh, calibrated. Now, this is uh, really important for a possible uh, really critical type of applications where there is uh, some safety elements that are involved. And so this time-based type of calibration may be increased depending on the uh, level of uh, safety that might be needed for that particular application. Now there is one other uh, type of calibration interval um, and that's going to be the performance-based uh, interval. And with this, this basically gives us the uh, ability to include uh, what would be considered a, a torque verification process. And so with that, we would um, use, oh, sorry, we would use a equipment um, that would be a, uh, a torque analyzer and a sensor um, and periodically test the tools that are in use uh, on the line uh, at a frequency uh, much greater than the actual calibration date uh, would and if the tool is performing and still within its tolerance and its um, accuracy, then we continue to use that tool. Uh, and as we continue to test that through the verification process at different levels uh, or different frequencies throughout uh, time, that tool will only be calibrated once it uh, is uh, falls um, out of the calibration um, or we see the, the performance may be drifting. Uh, we need to uh, have that sent out for, uh, for calibration. So the, the performance-based um, type of testing, um, or again, or a torque verification process is not based on time um, or cycles. It is basically um, based on how the tool is performing. And the longer the tool uh, is performing um, during uh, or over time, 
that tool remains in service and we can capture uh, that data that happens when we do the verification process, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so that uh, documentation is available uh, to, again, be traceable back to the deadweight standard. So every time we are doing the verification process, in essence, we are confirming the calibration process, but it's just not technically a calibration it is a, a torque verification. And so that'll lead us to our poll question uh, for today. Um, in your uh, facility or in your processes, are you uh, currently uh, using any type of torque verification process or is that uh, simply uh, something that comes by, by date or um, by time so or cycles? So with that, uh, let's go ahead and we can launch that poll. And there it is. And I'll give you guys a few minutes here to, uh, or just a, a little bit of time to uh, go ahead and answer that. I will take a drink. Let's go ahead and end it here on a nice uh, round number. And so um, currently, right now, um, the answer is yes, um, at a, a rate of 75% of the respondents and no for 25%. Uh, so that is uh, good to see that uh, people are handling their torque uh, verification um, but hopefully we can implement that into uh, the calibration uh, process or move to a, a time or excuse me, a performance based uh, type of calibration. And so uh, with the calibration, um, there are a, a number of different options that are available uh, for a calibration. Um, so uh, you can have a calibration done um, at different facilities. Uh, you can also have them done um, with us as well. And typically uh, you will see that um, we have three different calibration laboratories, uh, one in San Jose, California at our corporate office. We have another one in Foley, Alabama at our uh, service center and distribution center. Uh, and then we also have an additional one in uh, out just outside of London, England in the UK. Uh, so we can uh, do calibration uh, for you as well uh, with mounts tools. Obviously, you're dealing with the with the manufacturer and and that. But uh, if you want to send them to a local lab, um, that's certainly fine, too. But what we'll see when we do uh, send the tools out. Um, typically, you are going to um, always see uh, what the tool is uh, as far as the arrival condition um, of that tool, uh, the interval date, if it is being uh, cycled that way, uh, when the date it was done, uh, the actual tool itself, the range of that particular tool, what the unit of measurement is being used for, the accuracy setting for that particular tool, uh, and then the information regarding the lab here. But You'll also see the as found readings that give the condition um, the ability to either be in spec or out of spec. Uh, and then you have your as left uh, information um, once that certificate has been uh, generated or the tool, excuse me, has been adjusted. Uh, and then those readings are taken. Uh, and then you have the information regarding the sensor that was used uh, or analyzer. Uh, when the calibration for that particular item was done and a traceability number there. Again, um, the traceability uh, leads us back to the original uh, or gives us uh, that uh, information regarding when different steps within the actual process uh, to make sure that our tools are within uh, the calibration requirements. Uh, 
So typically we'll, we'll see that um, if this is something that you want to do um, internally, there are uh, some steps that you would need to take. Um, obviously, you're going to need the appropriate equipment to do that. You're also going to need the right uh, staff or uh, someone to be able to uh, do the actual um, calibrations. And you may need a, need a designated lab uh, or uh, area to be able to do this um, on, a, uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, so what type of equipment you're going to need? Um, you're only going to need a, a torque analyzer uh, with a torque sensor. Now, this particular unit has a built-in sensor uh, within it. Uh, and so we uh, will show that during uh, the demonstration portion. Um, of that. You could also use a, a different type of analyzer that will allow you to plug in different sensors to it. So uh, if you have multiple ranges that you need to check for different tool scenarios, um, you can use the appropriate sensor. And so that is a big component of uh, when we're doing our testing as well to make sure that we're using the right uh, range of sensor to match the range that we will be testing. So this is the, the kind of equipment that, uh, that you would need. Uh, you don't necessarily need dead weights or uh, hangers um, or wheels. Um, however, you could uh, do that as well, depending on if you wanted to actually calibrate the sensor in-house as well. Uh, if not, then that sensor uh, and analyzer is sent out for calibration um, on a periodic basis. Uh, and that way you won't need the uh, wheels, weights, or segment arms. Uh, but that is the equipment that you would need to be able to do uh, the analyzing. Um, in this case, we're talking about hand tools. So let's go ahead and we can take a look at um, our uh, analyzer. In this case, this is our uh, Easy Torque 3. Uh, and so the this unit here, uh, again, is a kind of a, a compact, uh, small unit. This sensor has an internal uh, range of 5 to 50 inch pounds. And so some of the unique uh, things about this analyzer is it gives us the ability to enter in what would be a, a go and no go zone. Um, everything within the green area here on the analyzer will be within the target and the tolerance that we can set. And so for us to do that, if we go to um, our setup menu, um, this will allow us to enter in what our target uh, torque value is here. And so in this case, I'm dealing with a torque unit that is in inch pounds. I'm going to be testing um, in the peak mode. The peak mode is going to generate or show us the value of the highest peak that uh, the analyzer sees in, in the torque. Um, and there are two other modes that we can use. Uh, first peak would be the mode that we would use to calibrate uh, click style wrenches. Uh, this actually will capture where the wrench clicks and it will uh, ignore kind of the uh, final torque because the, the click wrench um, can be uh, very operator influenced. So if the operator does not stop once the wrench clicks, they can basically turn that into a breaker bar or uh, add additional torque um, that we're not looking for. So the first peak mode helps us to see where the actual click happens. Uh, and then we have the track mode. Now the, the track mode gives us uh, the ability, uh, very much like a scale, as you apply load to the sensor, it's always going to be telling us where that value is. Uh, and this is good for calibrating um, digital style tools as well as uh, dial style uh, wrenches and screwdrivers. So um, if we can go ahead and uh, we want to enter in um, the value uh, that we're going to be looking for. So um, I've got one of our FG uh, screwdrivers here and uh, we want this to uh, be at a setting of, let's say, six inch pounds. Um, so we can enter in um, six here for um, our target uh, and the uh, specification or the um, ISO 6789 specification for this uh, tool is going to be 6%. So we can go ahead and enter in um, our tolerance here. And then another thing that we can do here is we can have the system automatically clear 
um, or we can manually clear it um, if we want. Um, so in this case, I have it set to one second. So after I take a reading, the unit is going to automatically clear it after one second. But the unit does capture uh, what that reading is with a time date stamp. Uh, we could also enter in a tool serial number if we want. Uh, and then that is stored locally here on the analyzer. And we can capture that through the use of an SD card um, that we have here. Um, one other thing that we can do is um, we have a, a graph function uh, and this will actually graph the, uh, the rundown for us. And if we wanted to enter in what the tolerance is. So if we were to take our uh, driver here, um, I'm pretty sure it's not sent to six. Um, you can see well, it's just a little bit under, but um, it's going to give us um, the actual graph of the, uh, the rundown here. But let's head back out to the operation mode. Um, I'm going to reset um, all of our readings here uh, on the screen. But you can see that it has changed the actual uh, graph um, here. So it has tightened up the, the green area to uh, a tolerance of 6%. And now we can go ahead and um, basically we want to warm up the tool uh, as it's being used on the joint before we actually do our testing. Uh, but since we've done a little bit of that here, I'll just cycle it a couple of times. And you can see that we are um, about a half inch pound or so uh, below the minimum target um, or beneath our target of um, six inch pounds. And so if I um, take this tool, we know it's a, a preset tool uh, because of the fact that there are no uh, scale. There's nothing to adjust on the outside of this tool. So it's internally um, adjustable. Uh, we have our uh, adjustment key here that um, I just simply uh, would insert into the bottom of the tool. And I can go ahead and make the adjustment that might be needed. And then we can go ahead and retest it. So that was a little bit too much there, not enough. So we're getting closer to uh, where we need to be, but it may require um, a couple more turns of the adjustment mechanism. So let's make a little bit more of a turn and let's try it again. So maybe that's a little bit too much. And then we can go ahead and back that off. And try it again. And I may have, let's see, there we go. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in this case, uh, our tool is um, in uh, the, uh, basically the, the specification. And at this point, we can go ahead and we can run our test. Now uh, with the uh, analyzer here, we could go ahead and we could take our readings. Um, I will highlight uh, one other thing that we can do. Uh, we do have some, um, the ability to do some CM and CMK type of uh, studies and so, as the we cycle the tool, uh, you can see that it's capturing um, all of this information. And so if we wanted to continue um, to get a much uh, larger sample uh, size, we could go ahead and uh, we could continue that, um, that testing. Uh, but that does give you that uh, ability to do that. Um, and all of this information, um, again, is stored uh, locally on the SD card. Now you could do this uh, again without this information. Um, you could do it with just uh, an analyzer and the sensor, and you would just have to manually um, take those readings and uh, take those down. So um, that is... Uh, again, the process is not too complicated and not too hard. Uh, it's just a matter of getting to uh, where you need to be. Uh, and again, if we want to do the same uh, type of test uh, with a, a Torx screwdriver. Uh, so this is, uh, again, 
um, or sorry, a torque wrench. Um, this is our FG uh, C wrench, and this will actually uh, cam over once uh, once we take our readings. Now this is going to be much different than um, our six inch pounds, um, but let's go ahead and see where we're at. Okay, so we're at about 25 um, inch pounds uh, for uh, this tool. So let's say we want to get to uh, say 28 uh, inch pounds for our testing. We can uh, come in to our setup, go to our settings, and we can enter in our target torque at 28. Uh, and we will leave the tolerance the same uh, at 6%. Now, if this tool was over uh, a 10 Newton meter rating, then that percentage would drop to 4%. Uh, but again, uh, because of the uh, 6%, we will leave that uh, the same. Now, if we did want to enter in the tool serial number for this test, we could come into our settings menu and we could enter in that tool serial number um, here. And now all of the readings that we take are going to be associated with this particular tool um, as part of the data field within the, uh, the unit's uh, capturing ability. And so if I take my reading, you can see we're just underneath there. So we are going to have to make some adjustments to this tool. And uh, in this case, the adjustments are done um, exactly the same way that they are with the uh, with the screwdriver. Um, so we have a little uh, mechanism inside here that we can need to either adjust uh, up or adjust down, depending on how much of the actual uh, torque we need. So if we turn it clockwise, that's going to increase the torque. Um, output. If we turn it counterclockwise, that will decrease that. And so, so we may need a little bit more uh, of an adjustment here um, on that. But again, this is uh, how we can go ahead and um, do the calibration process. Uh, at this point, then after you gather your uh, your readings, you can go ahead and um, put a label or a sticker on that. Uh, if you want to generate your own uh, type of certificate, uh, you could do that uh, as well within part of your, your processes of possible your ISO 9001, uh, where you're capturing the actual uh, data output that you're using here uh, on the actual analyzer. So again, the, the process is uh, not too difficult, but we just need to understand the different steps and the actual uh, use. Again, we warm up the, the, the tool on the analyzer. We go ahead and we make our readings, make our adjustments, and then we can come back and perform the test. Now, if, this, uh, if we had an adjustable tool um, here, uh, say we had a, an adjustable click style wrench, we would do the exact same process. However, we would uh, be testing at three different points, uh, 20%, uh, 60%, 100%, or uh, if you have a different specification, um, you would test to those types of uh, uh, values of the full range uh, of the tool. So same process would apply there for a, uh, an adjustable tool. And so with that, that will go ahead and uh, bring us to our uh, question and answer part. And so uh, with that, uh, Chris, uh, what questions do we have today? Hello, Dave. Thanks. Hello, Dave. Thanks. Uh, the first question we have is, you know, when testing uh, tools, does it, does it do the results change when you're holding the tool in a certain position? So uh, yes, you can affect the, the tool output um, by um, what could be determined, uh, could be uh, called side loading, um, where you may uh, not have the tool, maybe perpendicular, maybe you'd be leaning to the side a little bit. Uh, so with that, uh, that can affect the torque output. So we wanna make sure that the, the tool is uh, perpendicular uh, or at least the drive is perpendicular to the um, actual force uh, as we use the tool. Yes, yeah, so we wanna make sure that we aren't side loading um, that tool as that can affect the torque output. All right. 
Uh, next question is, why would you select first peak instead of peak mode when you're testing hand tools? So again, um, when we're testing um, tools that basically aren't a click wrench, we want to be looking for what the highest peak torque is. So with a screwdriver that cams over, uh, we want to see what that highest peak is during the camming process. The same would be for a cam over style wrench or even a breakover style wrench. Uh, we would want to use the peak mode. Uh, but the first peak mode captures uh, where a click wrench will actually uh, click. And so again, as it, the wrench is being used uh, and then the operator uh, hears the click or feels the click, they need to stop pulling on that tool because if they don't, they can have the ability to add additional torque to the actual assembly. Uh, and if we had that in peak mode, then the wrench is going to give us uh, values that are going to be uh, very scattered. Uh, and so we want to be able to capture when the wrench clicks. So if we have that, uh, that ability to capture that, we can see that the wrench is accurate uh, when it clicks and we're disregarding any type of over torque that may happen. Um, now, quality wise, uh, with the tool being used out on the floor, uh, that may be something that uh, may need some training for the operators uh, and for them to understand how that wrench operates. And if you see double clicking or um, really fast clicking, then you can probably guarantee that there's more torque that's being applied to that than you would see if uh, that wrench is pulled uh, correctly. So first peak mode for click wrenches, peak mode for just about everything else except for dial and digital tools. All right, Dave, uh, next question is, if you're calibrating a screwdriver, how many, minute, how many measurements are made in a complete revolution of the tool? Uh, so uh, typically we're, we're taking um, five readings. Um, it could be uh, 10, it just depends on the standard that, uh, that you may be using. Um, so uh, if I understand your question correctly, you wanna make sure that the, the, the driver hits all of its cams, um, I'm assuming. Um, if you have a, a different style uh, driver that may have uh, a different type of cam mechanism. You may only have uh, four uh, cams in there. Uh, sometimes there's only two cams uh, that you would be uh, testing for. So uh, it is uh, based off of um, the the specification, but typically it's, it's going to be five readings, but it could be uh, up to 10. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, next question is, um, what did you mean by warming up? You know, when you're warming up a torque wrench, it has an effect of measurements. So uh, typically, um, you know, mostly um, all uh, screwdrivers and torque wrenches um, are producing the uh, torque from a uh, the compression of a spring. And so we want to make sure that um, that spring is kind of uh, warm, uh, warmed up. And uh, so if we go ahead and we cycle the tool uh, a little bit, we allow that spring to compress and relax, compress and relax, and we get to kind of a normal state. Um, you may have seen in there when we were doing some of the testing that we got uh, kind of a, a wild uh, type of reading, but that could certainly be uh, from getting that tool uh, to go ahead and uh, basically allow it, the spring to get into its useful condition. All right, Dave. Uh, next question we had was on rundown adapters. What's the best practice when using those with uh, power tools? Uh, so uh, with a power tool, uh, this is going to be a little bit different than a hand tool. Uh, because with the hand tool, we can go ahead and we can put that directly into the drive. And we can go ahead and uh, go ahead and allow the torque to react off of the sensor. With a power tool, uh, we need to allow it to be able to get to its RPM running speed uh, and then shut off. Um, this will give us a more accurate reading than if we just stuck the tool in a drive and turned it on, it's immediately going to clutch out uh, and the readings may not be representative of when the tool is actually at its RPM, or RPM speed and then it clutches out. So a rundown adapter is used to help simulate basically the joint um, during the actual rundown. And so 
with a power tool, we would use a rundown adapter, allow the tool to basically simulate what's happening during the joint, uh, and then the tool will shut off, giving us a more consistent type of uh, reading with the use of the tool in its operating state. All right, uh, next question. Let's see. Is clicking a wrench more than one time incorrect method? Uh, yes, yes it is. So um, with a, uh, a click wrench, we want to make sure that uh, there's a nice, smooth, easy pull on the wrench. And once we hear the click or feel the click, then we release the wrench. Um, if there is a really fast pull uh, with that and the click happens, there's not enough time to react uh, to allow that um, force that's being generated or the initial inertia or the extra inertia with that. Uh, and we could be adding a, additional torque to that. Very similar to if you're driving uh, in your car, you're trying to stop behind a stop sign. If you're going uh, really fast, it may be difficult to uh, be as accurate as possible to stop behind the line um, as if you were uh, slowly approaching the line. Uh, you'd have a little bit uh, more control uh, to be as accurate as possible when stopping. So that's kind of the, the theory behind that. Again, a double clicking type of scenario um, is going to be adding additional torque. Um, and uh, if you wanted to do that type of testing, you certainly could try to put that tool in peak mode uh, and then run, run that test and you will see uh, readings that are uh, kind of all over the place. All right, Dave. Uh... I think that's all the questions we have for today. Any other ones we miss, we'll follow up after the event. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, again, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you found something useful out of this. And if you need any other information, feel free to contact us. Uh, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Recording stopped.